the big controversy at the moment is who's actually coming. What, what's going to happen about Har Harry and Meghan, you know, the Montecito money machine out there in California? Can they spare the time uh, to come to London for the coronation after all the bad blood that's been spilled uh, between them, in fact, mainly spilt by them. So uh, the king actually has played a blinder here. He's made it clear from the very beginning that his younger son uh, and his younger son's wife are perfectly welcome at the coronation. And, of course, that puts the ball in their court. They have to decide. If they decide they don't come, it, it will make them look a little bit petty and mean-spirited. And, of course, if they do come, it will leave them open to the charge of hypocrisy that they've said all these rather cruel and wounding things about various members of the royal family, and yet they still turn up at the great events. But you and I, Paul, know um, that there's never been a great family event without a drama or so. And in a way, you know, what family wedding has never had a problem about seating and who's coming and whether bad uncle what's name is going to be invited or not. So the big issue that I have about uh, Harry and Meghan and whether they go is they're going to get booed by a section of the crowd if they go up the steps of the Abbey. Is it potentially... Is it possible that there's a side door, that there's a different way, or protocol states, all guests, one entrance? Now, I would have said to you that the British public would never boo at an occasion like that. They would find that more effective and more deadly is silence. Silence can speak volumes. And I would have expected, if they wanted to express disapproval, they might get the silent treatment. Having said that, when they did turn up at St Paul's Cathedral for the um, Thanksgiving service for the uh, 70 years of Her Majesty the Queen, there was some sporadic booing from the crowd. So you don't know. But I think uh, these uh, problems, which you've identified so brilliantly, will be exercising the most expensive minds at Buckingham Palace and indeed, where to suit, where to seat them? Uh, which, where should they be seated? Should they be seated near the people they've insulted in books and in television programs, or not? But the, the king has been quite clever there again too, because traditionally, at a coronation, all royal princes there present were obliged to kneel and swear an oath of loyalty and fealty to the new monarch. Now, the king has changed that, uh, and that may have put, you know, Prince Harry in a difficult position, having said so many bad things about his father and, uh, and the crown, uh, to have to do that. So he, the king has now decided it will only be Prince William, the Prince of Wales, who has to do that during the ceremony. Maybe the way they'll get Harry and Meghan is you can call some of your mates at the uh, the BBC. Maybe they've got a couple of big cases where they're setting up the cameras. They can take them in that way a couple of days earlier, I, uh, I jest. But, uh, but I also want to ask you about speaking about sort of spare royals and spare, spare, spare royals and spare, spare, spare royals, former partners. There is another royal book, and apparently part of the publicity tour will be some truth-telling about Harry and Meghan, and it will come via Sarah Ferguson. Um, when do you reckon the last time Fergie saw Harry or has even met Meghan may be? <laughs> I think her last uh, appearance on the public scene was making a, um, a speech at the uh, funeral of Lisa Marie Presley, with whom she had become quite close. Now, listen, in 1986, I did the first television interview uh, together with Tony Carthew of ITN, of, of uh, Prince Andrew and um, Sarah Ferguson, as she then was, on the day they got engaged, and I went to Buckingham Palace and interviewed them. And that interview was said to be the most revealing, most amusing, most uh, incisive uh, and insightful interview ever, royal interview done at that, at that stage, because royal interviews were very, very rare at that time, and I went around the world with them on their earlier tours, and they were terribly, terribly, terribly good news. And I was very sad to see, after only 10 years, the marriage broke down in the terrible circumstances that it did. And I always had a sneaking um, affection 
for Sarah Ferguson. I thought she was good news. And when she came in, she was a breath of fresh air. And also I had the privilege of meeting her sister and her sister's children, her sister's husband. And they, of course, lived in Australia. They lived on a, a certainly a sheep farm, I believe, or a sheep station or something like that. They certainly lived uh, in the outback. And they came uh, to, uh, to London for that wedding at Westminster Abbey. And I think the two, the children from Australia were among the page boys and, um, uh, and bridesmaids. So, uh, <laughs> so she's written a new book. Well, I think the last one was called Budgie the Helicopter, wasn't it? I, I'm not quite <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, she, <laughs> and she's written books about how to lose weight. And then she sort of bother, goes against what she's saying by putting on a little bit of weight and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it is quite amusing. Let me just say that I don't think it's going to sell as much as uh, Harry's memoir, Spare, which, of course, has broken many records uh, as a uh, biography in, in the number of sales it, it's recorded, which I'm sure um, uh, Penguin Random House are um, hugging themselves with happiness that they've had such a fantastic commercial success. You mentioned Prince Andrew. Can you believe that he is even thinking about trying to undo a financial settlement with the Australian woman who accused him of abuse in connection to his friendship with Jeffrey Epstein? Well, um, Prince Andrew has got two chances of success in this, slim and none. As Muhammad Ali said in a completely different context on another occasion, but what is happening is that only a year ago, uh, Prince Andrew entered into a solemn binding legal agreement in a Manhattan courtroom with Mrs. Virginia Dufre, who lives in Western Australia. She's married to an Australian man. But she had alleged that when she was 17 and known as Miss Virginia Roberts, that she was uh, abused, sexually abused by the prince in London, in, in the uh, Muse House of... Uh, of uh, Elaine Maxwell, and then in the townhouse of uh, Jeffrey Epstein in New York and on his private island of Little St. James in the American Virgin Islands. And those were very serious allegations. The prince, for his part, always said that he didn't know the woman, that it didn't happen, uh, that it had never occurred. And to be fair, let us say, Prince Andrew was never uh, uh, charged with anything, let alone convicted. This was a civil case, and civil cases are not solved by jail time. They're solved by the exchange of money known to the legal profession as damages, and the legal profession always takes a nice big chunk of that too, of course. Now, this sum of money was said to be £12 million or £7 million or £3 million, but certainly a lot of money. And the idea was that that was the end of the case. Now, Prince Andrew now <laughs> wants to revisit that agreement, uh, he said that that deal was made in order to uh, take the uh, focus, uh, not to take the focus away from the Queen's Diamond Jubilee during the summer. So he made that deal. But now he's encouraged to go back and ask the judge uh, to rescind that because he feels that he can prove now uh, that uh, these allegations against him, which he never admitted, he said he'd never met the lady, I think that was the phrase he used, uh, was a, a case of mistaken identity and false memory. And he's encouraged in that uh, by a very famous American lawyer called Alan Dershowitz. Now, he, Alan Dershowitz, is a, a professor of law at Harvard University, and he's a celebrity lawyer. He, he helped to defend O.J. Simpson, um, he defended uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, who we've, we, we've talked about. And at one stage, Mrs. Dufre was alleging that he, uh, Alan Dershowitz, had also sexually abused her. But then she rescinded, she withdrew those, uh, uh, those allegations and said, no, she'd remembered it incorrectly. So I imagine, and I don't know, that encouraged by this, uh, Prince Andrew wants to say, well, if she's got it wrong about Alan Dershowitz, she's got it wrong about me. Because he wants some way back to royal life, to public life. At the moment, uh, he's banished to outer darkness. He has no role. Uh, but I've 
felt very strongly, he's now 62, that, you know, he should enjoy his growing family. One of his daughters is having a second baby. He should enjoy that. He should spend plenty of time uh, on, the, on the golf course. And he should forget about it because, as I say, his chances of actually overturning uh, this agreement are, are slim. Yeah, absolutely. That horse well and truly bolted. Michael, thank you so much uh, for your insight, your conversation and your enthusiasm, uh, let alone your knowledge. You're a good bloke and we like talking to you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure, Paul.